is involved in the other platform. This meeting is being recorded. Um, sorry and, for the interruption uh, there. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, so I try to uh, to move uh, to a step forward uh, in order to uh, debug some potential issue you could have with the other platform. Um, so right now I figure out why on some uh, code rates I have some issue, and so by uh, reading the register I see that sometimes on certain code rates. Uh, the encoder is not uh, getting the right metadata. And, uh, and uh, after a few days, uh, 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 my conclusion was that it should be eight bytes blind. And uh, eight bytes is 64 bits. And the only uh, only 64 bits in my design is the uh, DMA deck uh, bus width. And as Paul uh, could explain maybe in more details, um, there is some uh, issue uh, because we can't write to the encoder only two bytes, which is normally IQ, uh, sorry, uh, four bytes, uh, two uh 16 bits uh i and two and uh, well uh, well two iq sorry and um by reducing the the, the bus width of uh, 32 bits then uh, all the code rate is working and um and uh, yeah so i'm very confident right now I can uh, change from uh, one mod code to the other seamless. And the next step right now is uh, getting, um, uh, well, to encapsulate uh, TS transport stream over BB frame. That's the first, uh, the, the first step uh, to see if all the data are OK. And then uh, try to integrate the DVB GAC. That's it. Back to you. Well, thank you so much for your expertise and leadership and advice here. It's been really invaluable. Um, so the the minimal DVB test that, that you've written uh, seems to be working for the ZC706, and we've gone through the the source code carefully to try to see where we went wrong, and we haven't we haven't found it yet, but it's in there somewhere. So um, I think we're very close to being able to solve problems and to increase the quality of what we're doing. So it, we could not do it without you. Thank you so much, Everest. All right, I'm going to turn the floor over to, to Paul, who's going to talk about um, some of the things that that Everest brought up uh, with a, a sort of a realization on the the bus width and uh, or restrictions on the DMA controller that we are, are working with and a, a possible um, design that might help us increase the resiliency of our downlink encoder for our 10 gigahertz uh, downlink, which is it's on the hand bands and is supposed to be for, for amateur radio communication. This sort of uh, problem that we're dealing with has wider uh, applicability, of course, uh, so we're we're trying to do the best possible job we can. Um, so that's that's two things that we're going to talk about, and I'm going to turn it over to Paul to to detail it out. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Um, let me start out with some background for people who are joining us and not already familiar with the ins and outs. Um, from our point of view here, we're uh, we're working with a reference design provided by analog devices, which is designed to work with their, their radio chip, the AD9371. And the, uh, the ZC706 is the uh, board that hosts the Xilinx FPGA part with its zinc processor on board. So we're running on board the, the hard arm in the chip and using the FPGA to talk to the radio. Okay. So it's designed to take samples uh on the we're talking about the transmit chain now 
Uh, it's designed to take samples by DMA from processor memory. And that goes into, goes through a DMA controller block, which then goes into a FIFO block, which is only responsible for uh, a little bit of smoothing out of, of various rate uh, variations. And then that goes on through some other uh, logic, routing logic mainly, to finally get to the DACs, the digital to analog converters that make the analog signals that make the radio. Okay, so that's the standard arrangement with the reference design. It doesn't do anything with the signal except move it along the pipeline and then transmit it. Now, in order to use this for our uh, and DBBS2 downlink, we've gone inside the reference design, uh, split apart the DMA controller from the, uh, the DAC FIFO, and in between, we placed our encoder block. And our encoder block takes BB frames, uh, which are a variable length amount of data that corresponds to a fixed amount of output samples. And it so it takes these BB frames in through the interface that would normally be samples from DMA from the processor memory. It does all the stuff in the DVB-S2 standard to make samples out of it. And then they go off to the FIFO and down the routing chain uh, to the to the DAX. Um, and on the ZC706, which Michelle and I have been working on here in the San Diego lab, uh, we've been having all sorts of trouble getting this to work reliably. And I think there's more than one thing going on, but one of the things that's definitely going on is exactly the thing that Everest found, that on the interface between the, the processor memory through DMA and into the encoder, we're restricted by the capabilities of the DMA controller, which is a standard block provided by uh, analog devices, I guess, standard FPGA HDL block. And it's fancy enough that we probably don't want to try to re-implement it. So we're stuck with its limitations uh, for the time being anyway. And one of its limitations is that it can only transfer um, multiples of, of a byte. And that number, the size of that multiple, <laughs> depends on the widest bus that's connected to it. Um, so in our case, with the reference design as it comes, we're bringing in 64 bits at a time out of processor memory, so eight bytes, and then shipping out uh, whatever's convenient. It was originally 128 bits or 16 bytes, I guess that is. Uh, we narrowed that down to 32 without too much remaining controversy, uh, but the 64 still governs. So that means that in order to get through that DMA controller, you have to be transmitting chunks of eight bytes. Uh, of course, the people who designed the DMA, the DVBS2 protocol did not anticipate this. <laughs> they assumed that bytes were gonna go through in whatever number were needed. And so they've standardized packet sizes that are not multiples of, of 16 bytes or eight bytes, or uh, I think in all cases, they are multiples of four bytes, but maybe that's only, maybe that, even that's not true. So the result is that uh, when we send a, a BB frame through, we need to do something about figuring out where the beginning and end of it, it of the packet, the BB frame packet is, and we can't rely on the DMA for that. Um, we can try, if we set up the DMA to be uh, a multiple of a certain width and then ensure that this, bursts we're sending are always a multiple of that width, then it'll be, it'll, it'll work, but it's still sort of not reliable. It's depending on these DMA transfers to frame the, uh, the, the packet. Um, one of our use cases, maybe the most important use case for the, for the short to medium duration is transmitting a bunch of pre-cooked BB frames that are in a file. Um, we, we could spend as much time and as much complexity as we need to cook the BB frame package up, make a file out of it, and then stream it through at full rate. Um, the trouble here is that files come in one byte increments. And 
there's no way, no inherent way for a file to be in packets. So the standard solution for this problem is to use some kind of framing protocol. And I'm proposing uh, that we might want to switch our interface for file transmission to use this framing protocol. And there's many framing protocols to choose from. The most common one is uh, used in PPP and SLIP and even AX25, uh, where it's used in the KISS protocol. Um, and it's a byte stuffing protocol where you get, whenever you get uh, your frame indicator byte, you have to replace it with two bytes. And then there's another value you have to replace with two bytes. And there's a little bit, little dance you do. And it's pretty efficient in the average case where with random data, but in the worst case, it doubles the amount of bytes that have to be transmitted. Uh, there's a more modern, or at least a newer, uh, byte stuffing protocol called COBS, which stands for Consistent Overhead Byte Stuffing, which has about the same average overhead and has a much better worst case. In the worst case, it's about 0.4% overhead which is a lot better than 100% overhead, which, which uh, PPP style byte stuffing has. So if we decide that it's worth the trouble, and I think it probably is, we should write all of our files uh, encoded with COBS and then put a little block into the encoder wrapper that decodes COBS so that any bytes with any DMA boundaries that are convenient without even worrying about where the packet boundaries are, just stream that stuff in. And the little block that we add, will take it apart into BB frames with their mode word that we're prepending, which every refers to as the metadata. Uh, that stuff will be clearly delimited, self-correcting if it ever gets out of sync which is not the case with the current design. If it ever gets out of sync, it stays out of sync. Um, and that gives us all sorts of convenience in manipulating these pre-recorded files. We can even cut them apart at arbitrary boundaries and still send them in, and it would still work. Um, at some a pretty limited expense, the, the decoder is the easy part for COBS. It doesn't require a lot of look ahead or anything like that. Just a couple of bytes of storage. I think it's one byte of extra latency which disappears into the packet size anyway, and uh, not very much logic. So it should be an easy block to write, even for novices like me. And we should be able to get that working fairly quickly. And that should completely eliminate any question of, of uh, byte alignment on the input of the encoder. And that's, that's the long version. I'm going to paste into the chat some links that'll save you... Uh, about 10 seconds of Googling, I guess, to find uh, information on COBS. Let's see, that is the right paste. There it is. Um, I recommend going, if you want to read just one thing, go to the original paper. It's pretty brief and easy to read and explains it pretty well. Um, so I'm interested in feedback on this. If it, somebody thinks it's a dumb idea that it's a solved problem now that we've reduced the uh, the size down to 32 bytes or 32 bits in the, every solution, uh, fine. But on the ZC706, that's going to be more painful. We're going to have to modify some more things, I think. Um, and it doesn't get all the benefits that I talked about of being able to handle the files with great flexibility. So let me stop talking and see if anybody has anything to say about that. <clears throat> I'm looking at Wikipedia on the COBS, and it looks pretty easy to understand. I've not heard of it before. Very interesting. Yeah, I discovered it fairly recently myself after having been familiar with, with KISS framing since the 1980s. Um, it's quite a revelation. They've even got source code for encode and decode. Yeah, in C. C. I, oh, I looked around trying yeah. to find an existing HDL block that we could grab. If we could find one that already had AXI interfaces, it would be a drop-in. Oh, well, of course, I have not found that. No. <laughs> that. That's asking for a lot. It is. <clears throat> but at least you get that general idea laid out in front of you here. Huh. That's very interesting. 
So come back next week, I guess, if you, anybody, or put it in Slack. If you, anybody has any questions or any thoughts about whether this is worth the trouble or whether I'm on the wrong track entirely, uh, just say so. I, I don't mind hearing that I'm, that I'm making things more complicated than they need to be. That does happen sometimes. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll put it out where we usually uh, put all of these discussions out, make sure it's published and solicit feedback uh, as much as I can to try to get um, more comments. Um, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about anything that helps us make this system more resilient for, especially for space, um, but also for terrestrial deployments that are not easy to, um, to upgrade or maintain or fiddle with. So, you know, and just resiliency in general and making it um, easier to, you know, I think that the receiving artifact, the receiving circuit should do all that it can to, to accept anything that it, you know, to go out of its way, in other words, to, to accept streams of data that may be interrupted uh, from, from operators or, you know, maybe rudimentary there could be some malformations or, you know, uh, there's all sorts of things that can happen to, to transmission. So I think anything that helps resiliency is good. And we've already seen that the, the encoder, which is uh, brilliant and well done is it, it can get off track and, and it's, uh, it's relying on things being delivered very precisely uh, from, from memory. So we're not always going to have that. We can't protect the input to the, uh, to the encoder as much as we would probably like. Uh, we want it to be widely useful to people. So I think anything that helps resiliency is good. And if this 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 proposal needs some some solid review from from as many different people as possible. There was, was there a second thing that you wanted me to discuss? I, I think you said so, but I didn't catch what the second thing was. Oh yeah. Um, this is a big one, um, but I think just in general. Oh, and also the 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 restriction that we realized on the DMA, which when we I think we're we're so we're taking care of it. We we did uh, to to test the restriction, um, and I guess this this kind of this goes into my very brief report for this week. Uh, so I've been just trying to help get things working, and so Everest's uh, code for the minimal DVB test and our code that we wrote. Uh, is almost pretty much the same. There's a procedure that you do on from the processor side to use a design like what we're trying to accomplish. And since we're both using IIO, industrial input output, so we both sets of code walk through the same general set of things. Uh, there's some minor differences, like we at, at no point did we ever enforce um, one of the things that Everest did about uh, whether it was blocking or non-blocking it, it just reinforces the default. So I put that in. Uh, and then Everest uses a slightly different call for IIO for start versus uh, first uh, for the buffer. But we, we're we doing the same thing. So how come Everest code works on the ZC706 and ours does not? It times out every time we get the negative 110 error. I don't have any hair left. So <laughs> this is all not real. I'm, I'm like, what the heck is going on? Uh, and because the, the any adjustment takes a, a long time to filter, like if you have to go back to change the HDL, we're talking like an hour hit to some of these builds. So um, I have no idea what's going on with this. We were blaming the DMA, but even after fixing the problems with our, you know, 64 bit uh, restriction, nah, it didn't cooperate. What we have been able to do is, uh, operate from, from MATLAB. So the exact same HDL, same bitstream. MATLAB can order it around. We can change the profile, which is something else I think we need to talk about. And it's something we did, uh, we were able to kind of come to grips with yesterday. For, for complicated RFICs like the 9371, you really have to have a configuration file. Uh, there's some things that you cannot modify after it gets up and running. So you better get them right in the configuration. And the configuration sets like clock speed, symbol rate, uh, band, bandwidth, 
Uh, it's filtering, so all the filter taps for the receiver, for the transmitter, for the observational receiver, all of that stuff is set in the configuration file. Now you can do this in code, and it, that's how people used to do it. So they used to actually set all this stuff with calls. But like I said, some of these things, once you, once you get to the actual code, the C code running, that it's just going to ignore you. So that's the 9371. Um, and so now we, we got up and running. It's a, uh, there's several different ways to produce a, a profile. So these profiles, you can do it by hand if you're, if you're really uh, into going through documents and these documents are like 500 pages long and you can poke through and figure out how to generate all this stuff. Or you can use the tools that Analog Devices and MATLAB have given you. So Analog Devices has TES, which is the Transceiver Evaluation Software Package. It's free and pretty cool. And what it does is produces the profile and other artifacts that were used with the no OS, with no operating system. You can run this stuff bare metal and it would produce the files that you needed in order to set up your transceiver. The MATLAB version produces a text file that you then put on the host. As far as I can tell, you can just send it to the, to the host uh, or you can work it into the device tree. That's that's when you're really sure, <laughs> like you're ready to ship it if you do that, you know. Uh, and from MATLAB, interestingly enough, that has a transceiver package for all of this that we use, you can swap in the the profiles with a line of code. So MATLAB's really the best tool for the job here in in fooling around and and experimenting and doing engineering with your transceiver. And we were able to successfully do that. So we can swap in the, the things that we need in order to get the symbol rate down to something reasonable, because right now with the code that we're running, it's just the ZC706 and the, and the 9371 are running wide open at maximum. You know, So this is the equivalent of like, you're in your garage trying to repair your car. Uh, you know, you have your hot rod and you've swapped out engines and you're, you're, you've got some extra cool stuff that you've put in there, like our encoder. And now you're firing it up for the first time and it just, it catches for a few seconds and then conks out on you because, well, you don't have the right, whatever, you know, you, you haven't adjusted it. You don't, yeah, there's so many things that can go wrong with trying to bring up an engine and modern complicated circuits like this are exactly like a, a, a car, you know, so you have all this sort of stuff. You've got the air fuel mixture, you've got your valves, you've got, you know, cylinders, you've got all sorts of crap going on so that's what we're doing we've got the we've got the engine fired up and it's moving for a few seconds and in the case of ever east he's like actually got it you know up and running but uh now the next step is to to fine tune all of our clocks and symbol rates and filters get the right filters for, for this one um you can you, on the design for the over there on on uh Karapi, you can see um I think all these artifacts working in the Pluto design. So, so the Pluto implementation has all this stuff um, working and incorporated. There's a separate whole filter production uh, tool chain for the 9361, which is what's on, on Pluto. Uh, so the exact same encoder over on the 9360, 9371 uh, with the bigger FPGA is what we're trying to get, get moving. Uh, so that's that's how it's going, going pretty pretty well. Wish it would go faster, but like, hey, we're we'll just keep hitting it until it's done. And you know, I think as soon as we get the uh, our profile, so what we want the transceiver to do in terms of uh, oh, an interesting point the 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 10, 10 megahertz bandwidth that we're talking about doing for the for this transponder. That's as low as you can go with the 9371. It turns out that 10 megahertz is, that's it. That's as low, that's as narrow band as you can go. So I think we knew this when we picked the chip. Uh, Wally Ritchie uh, was the lead on this. Um, and I remember a brief discussion. It was like, oh, don't worry, it'll do 10, it'll go down to 10 megahertz. And I was like, oh yeah, these are, these are, these are chips that are used for much higher bandwidth. You know, it didn't really occur to me that it might be um, what our use case, you know, for the satellite subband and the terrestrial uh, digital high speed subband for terrestrial. They are literally at the limit of the lower end of what we can do. So this opens up a lot of other questions as to, you know, okay, once we get this design uh, working a little bit, uh, what else can we mess with? 
that uh, that's that's at 24 or 47 gigahertz. Where else can we go with even wider bandwidths on these on these bands, and take our system and have some serious fun with some with lots of bits. Uh, so that's in the very near future. Um, that's that's pretty much uh, from 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 my point of view what what I'm seeing and experiencing. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, I'll stop here and open the floor up to any other comments or questions or discussion. I've got one other thing I wanted to cover for from Remote Labs' point of view. Um, this is a an innovation in usability for people who are trying to do radio debugging remotely. Mm -hmm which includes us because we're like across the house from the remote lab. So it's easier if we could uh, operate things remotely. Um, and it has to do with looking at the spectrum analyzer output. Uh, the spectrum analyzer, we can make screenshots like we can with all the other instruments, but that's slow and kind of awkward. And it's hard to tell what's going on without seeing it in motion. Luckily, the spectrum analyzer has uh, HDMI video output. And when I first set up the remote lab, I set it up so that you could uh, you could get access to that through uh, uh, VLC and an X lash up. Um, that worked for a while. It was kind of a little bit slow, even on the LAN and janky as heck. And with some upgrade to some system software somewhere, it stopped working. Um, so what I've done now uh, is finally, this has been on the wish list for a long time, is I've turned this into a video streaming solution where there's a program running on a Raspberry Pi, which I, and I've added a Raspberry Pi so it can be dedicated to this purpose that receives the HDMI from the Spectrum Analyzer and makes a, a relatively low bit rate uh, video stream. And then on your side, wherever you are in the world, you just need a program that can receive a video stream. Um, and FFmpeg is, serves for both. So FFmpeg um, creates the video stream here in the lab, and then you can use its, uh, its companion program called FFplay to receive uh, locally. And I've bundled this up into a script that uses SSH to get into the remote lab and um, automatically shuts down the link when you when you're done with it and stuff like that uh, this is not quite ready to publish but soon uh, we'll be making this available so if you have any interest in looking at the spectrum analyzer in real time watch out for that and test it out make sure it works for you as soon as i release it i think it'll be pretty neat it's much higher performance it uses less than a megabit of bandwidth uh, consistently for the spectrum analyzer doesn't have that much motion, usually just the screen part. And even that can be localized, it compresses really well. So this is a high resolution display. I can, let me show you what it looks like actually. So I do have it running here at the moment. If I can be allowed to share my screen. There we go. Okay. Let's see, you should be seeing the spectrum analyzer now. Somebody confirm that for me. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So that's that's what you'd see. Hopefully, it hasn't been mangled too much by Zoom, but it looks nice and crisp on my screen. Um, so nothing on it right now. So boring, but um, that's the idea. Stop sharing. There we go. So that's my news for the remote lab. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments or topics? I have some questions for after the meeting. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and close our, our FPGA meeting. Thank you very much for all of this amazing hard work. And we are starting to see some, some really good results. And you can see the, um, you know, where it will go from here uh, to several different projects to um, open source, highly elliptical orbit 
satellite projects for the amateur satellite service, uh, lots of terrestrial applications, um, and just general education in terms of advanced digital communications. So those are all things that we're very interested in making happen. Uh, if you're watching this and you want to get involved, then uh, please go to our website. It's openresearch.institute slash getting dash started. And I'll put that into the um, into this video so that you can just click on it. Uh, but that go getting started link will take you to all the different ways to participate and follow. And we appreciate everybody that uh, that pitches in and helps us do all of these ambitious things. So thank you and see you next week. Maybe just a last remark. Yes, sir. You have the floor. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know if you noticed that uh, Daniel, uh, he, for GPZ, has uh, written an article about BBBGSU. Um, thanks to, uh, well, we try with uh, Brian, uh, G4, WVG, and me uh, to get some BB frame out of the mini tune. And uh, it seems to work. So, oh, that's good news. Yeah. So, I could uh, try to uh, have a receiver. Uh, well, I have some mini tuner here. And so, the good news is it's not only the transfer stream. But we can receive also the BB frame, so we can debug the DVBGC. Awesome! That's really cool. Um, yeah, and uh, Daniel has uh, written a nice article about uh, about this, and uh, use uh, GNU Radio for that. Fantastic. Okay, yeah. I'll be sure to. I think I I think I know about it, or I saw a headline in the notifications, so I'll track it down and make sure that it's part of this recording. Okay, right. Thank you. Bye.